So, welcome to the stage, Esther Payne, who's going to be talking here at Foss Asia about RFC 1984, or why you should start worrying about encryption backdoors and mass data collection. Good afternoon, the audience of tomorrow. Literally tomorrow, because I'm currently recording this the night before, and the reason for that is over there. So, safety is very important, so we'll just get started from last night. Before we begin, I want you to have a look at a picture of this lovely French frog. No frogs were harmed in the making of this presentation. But can I concentrate on that frog and a metaphor with putting that poor frog right there in a pan of water and then slowly heating that pan up while I say a few statements to you. So, do we need privacy? All of our family and friends are using social media and they're putting all sorts of information up about you and their friends and other members of your family, so everything's just up there. And teenagers, well, since the early 2000s, teenagers have been putting everything up about themselves and communicating with each other using social networks. So it's pointless. Throw privacy out the window, we don't need it, we're in a connected world now. And because of all the f threats to our way of life, like terrorists, like pandemics, we need to give up a little bit of that privacy for our own security. So yeah, is that water feeling a tiny little bit warm now? Maybe. So we've got a very difficult problem space. We've got to try and explain privacy in ways that people can understand that how what they put online can affect them in real life. Now, this isn't the first time humanity has had to face this. Um, at the time when cities were being built, civilizations were Im continuously improving. How did you convince your general populace that perhaps they want to follow the rules? And ancient Greece had it with things like Aesop's fables and to some extent with Greek mythology. Which leads us on to this guy. He's not Greek, he's actually Roman. And his name was Ovid. And he was famous because he was a poet in the time of the latter reign of Augustus. Augustus, who had learned from his predecessors not to go and openly grab power and declare yourself dictator, had gone and hoodwinked the Roman Republic into thinking that they were still a democracy and everything was alright because he was the first citizen. Ovid tended to write about gods and goddesses and how their whims and decisions affected those in the lower pecking order, humanity and lower orders of supernatural entities like nymphs. Now you might think that this is just mythology. In Roman times, mythology was intrinsically tied in with the state. Julius Caesar had been recently made a god and Augustus after his death would also become a god. So when he was, when Ovid was writing about mythology and criticising the father of the gods, Jupiter and Roman, Zeus and Greek, he was explicitly critiquing the regime. And unfortunately, he did that and it ended up with him being exiled. The main reason was because of a publication he wrote which was called the Ars Armata, which was about how to get women's interest, pick them up and then get rid of them again when you just were bored of them. And um, there was also a little bit of a, a rumour about him uh, having a, a good time with um, Augustus's granddaughter Julia. No one's really quite sure. He ended up in exile on the Black Sea in modern day Constanza and he kept occasionally trying to ask to be let back in, in from exile. And Augustus said no, and his, pre his um, successor Tiberius also said no. So Ovid died salty and pretty upset about it. But why am I telling you about Ovid? Well, what Ovid did was he remixed Greek myths and made them palatable for a Roman audience. And with privacy, there's only really one myth you want to consider. Io and Argus. Io was a beautiful nymph. And Zeus, doing what Zeus does, decided that he wanted to have a good time with Io. She said no, 
And then there was a, a bit of a me too moment. And Zeus then decided he needed to cover this up quite badly. So he did that by covering the entirety of the land in a massive cloud. Now as what happens when any someone in authority decides to cover things up, someone notices. And in this case, his wife Hera noticed. And he had form. So she went on down to investigate what was going on. And she went, hey Zeus, what you up to there? And what she saw was Zeus standing there with a cow. Because for an extra bit of covering up, he turned poor Ayo into a heifer. So Hera went, hey, can I have the cow? She's ever so pretty. And Zeus went, yeah, 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 yeah have, have the cow, absolutely. It's a gift for you, my lovely wife. And she slopes off. And she went, nice. And being the victim blamer that she was, she decided to keep the cow, but put it under constant surveillance using a giant called Argus Panoptes. Argus Panoptes was a massive giant who was a shepherd and had a hundred eyes covering the entirety of his body, all around his body, which meant he had 360 panoramic view. And he never really needed to go to sleep. In order to rest, he only had to close two eyes at a time. So poor Ayo, she's a cow and she's under constant surveillance after having been violated. So she got the word out to her father, who's a rubber god, who, along with all the other members of her family, finally put enough pressure on Zeus so that he felt a tiny, tiny bit guilty and thought, oh, I should try and get her out of the captivity where she's being surveilled constantly. And so what he did was he asked another god, Hermes, to sort it for him. And how Hermes did it was he did an exploit on Argus. He came up in disguise as a shepherd and told him a big long story which bored Argus so much he fell asleep. Hermes then killed him. Exploit done. Io was able to run away, but Hera, being like so much of our society who likes victim blaming whistleblowers and other people, made a gadfly pursue, pursue the cow all the way to the banks of the River Nile, where Io fell over and then was like restored to her natural form. Yay! So, I've been talking about a Greek myth. What exactly did Ovid, the, Ovid, the Roman poet, bring to this? Thing. What he brought was peacocks. Hera, being incredibly upset that her tool of surveillance had been murdered, decided to memorialise him forever by putting all of Argus's eyes on the tail of a peacock. So that was Ovid's extra little finesse to the legend. And um, even though peacocks aren't actually a, a Roman bird, he just thought it was a cool metaphor. But is this actually relevant to nowadays? Well, it is because if you're a security firm who say likes doing video surveillance for companies, what you do is you call yourself Argus Security and you bang a big eye right in the middle of your company logo. Argus Panoptes has stayed within our public consciousness with famous television reality shows that explicitly reference that. But, um, I mean, how relevant is it nowadays? Well, I mean, it's a great myth. Peacocks aren't really that appropriate around the world. They can mean different things to different religions. So well, we'll leave that aside. We'll try something else. Because the trouble is everybody focuses on the technology. They're not focusing on the cow. We've forgotten to focus on the person who's been surveilled against, the poor cow. So we'll try George Orwell next, we'll try 1984. Now, everybody remembers about the telescreens, about Ingsoc, about the idea that we've always been at war with East Asia. But we're missing one of the main points about this story because it's not just about totalitarian regimes. It's about a philosophical exploration of an idea from the 18th century by a philosopher called Jeremy Bentham. And what Jeremy Bentham designed was a panopticon. And it's a very simple idea. 
you have a dome or a building of cells all around a central tower. And within this tower you have one individual and they have a light that will shine on individual cells. Now you have the apparatus of surveillance there. But there's one slight problem with that. Because we're focusing on the technology, we're not focusing on what the idea was meant to do. Bentham designed that panopticon with the idea of, of controlling the human factor. He was around at the time of the Industrial Revolution in the UK, where they were trying to mechanise industrial procedure. So you're, when you're having to control a large body of people, be it factory workers, be it prisoners, or rather relevant now, quarantine people within a pandemic, you want to maximise your resources without overworking them. And the, with the idea of the light being shown into your cell is that you're aware of being surveilled. You may not know when or where you're being surveilled and that's the idea. Because you know you could be looked at at any point in time, you don't know who's looking at you, it gets you to modify your behaviour which is explored quite deeply within the book. But it's very hard to focus on the person being surveilled because Winston Smith is part of that apparatus, but he's still a human being and he's as dull as ditch water. So it's relevant, but we have to think about other ways to explore this idea. And Orwell did not just inspire popular culture with shows like Big Brother. It also inspired the IETF to notice that there was a very important number coming up in their RFCs. And it came up at a time when the US government were trying to do a trade embargo on encryption. And they were incredibly worried, they'd been worried about this since the 60s, that as the network of information grew between consumers and the government, that there could be a very real threat to the privacy of those consumers. And the US were very much trying to limit the creation of more available sources of encryption for ways to do that. And in 2015, rather impressively given what happened later on that year, they decided to make it best current practice with the, uh, the meetings show that they felt that people had been using this RFC as best come practice for years. Let's just make it official. So the IETF and the Internet Arch Architecture Board were very concerned about the need for increased protection of international commercial transactions on the internet. This was the birth of e-commerce and they realised that they needed encryption in order for things like credit card details not to leak everywhere. But the US government didn't agree because they also knew that what else happened on the internet that perhaps needed encryption were private messages between people. So they decided to go and restrict escrow for a start, which meant a US firm who was trying to export encryption had to leave clues for their client who were in Europe through commentary, through instructions, because they had to strip out the encryption first and it needed to be encoded back in later. And the US government were also trying to do things like the clipper chip, which was kind of like a kind of the idea of a virtual crocodile clip so that you could still listen in conversations. But in theory, the, the information was still encrypted so the bad guys couldn't get at it, just the government could. And sometimes they just said, why do you even need to make the encryption that strong? You don't really. And of course, some regimes just don't agree with encryption entirely. So why am I so worried about this? Why do, why do I think there's such a threat to privacy? Well, we have it at the moment with various terrorist attacks, people trying to, to plan out shenanigans and governments want to know about that. But it's not just targeted at individual organisations. They want a dragnet for everybody's information that they can just search it for their convenience. Snowden has shown us this. And there's a heck of a lot of intelligence that can be gathered from your communications within Facebook. What you put up there, what you react to when people post memes. 
and your friends and family, they just, they're so curious about the idea of DNA services and where do they come from and are they, are they really from Ireland originally as their family history says? And they don't understand. They think of it just as it's a physical DNA test and it will be stored somewhere. They don't realise it will be encoded and compared later on. And as I said, the government's very, very interested in knowing what its population is up to. In 2015, both the UK Prime Minister and the Australian Premier didn't want encryption to be a factor in communications. The, ye, the Australian Premier, in fact, said that the laws of mathematics uh, were subject to the laws of Australia. And both the UK and Australia had metadata bills, which are designed to force large, uh, large broadband providers to collect data that you give. And the data that's being collected are things like when you're connecting, where you're browsing to, what are your IP addresses. These are all bits of information that on their own don't seem that bad, but they tie and they profile you. And of course the US from 2015 and now in 2019 and 2020 are incredibly keen for weakened encryption and backdoors into encryption so that they can have it easier. What they don't tell you though is that there's a spectrum in terms of their access. A Vice article found that sometimes the police can very easily get into your mobile devices. They just want it easier. And the NSE has had access to America's domestic communications for a while and they're not meant to because the NSE's remit is meant to be for international, not domestic. And we have things like the Online Harms Bill in the UK and the Earn It Act, which are designed to try and protect the most vulnerable in our society, children, from child trafficking and child pornography. But these bills will not protect them. What they will do is threaten those vulnerable children's privacy in the first place, because it means that children, as they grow up, will not be able to investigate parts of themselves that they'd like to. They will have cradle to grave surveillance. And political parties want to know how, how they can make you vote for them. Now most of us, we're pretty sturdy in what we believe and what we, how we think a party should be and what we should vote for. But you have voters that, in the middle, that are in the middle and can swing from side to side. And when political parties are collecting your data, they're really collecting it to find those voters who can be manipulated. And with us being in the middle of a pandemic at the moment, this is where the panopticon really comes into place because governments do need to have your details, need to have some way to track you in case you are infected with COVID-19. The difficulty is, is that we're giving them all of these powers, but we don't know when we're going to get back the power to not be surveilled. And we have to consider what happens once that data is all gathered up. Is it going to be kept safely? Is it going to be destroyed? Is it, like with the NHS in the UK, going to be sold on to pharmaceuticals and health firms? And are hospitals actually storing that data properly? Because German researchers found medical records on an open file store online. And that was particularly a bad thing in Australia because that data is not meant to leave individual states. Um, and of course, political officials can touch commonly shared data stores and, and use it inappropriately. The, when, I, when the slide says UK government officials are supposed to be UK border force, etc. Because public servants in the way that you and I might think, it was third party contractors with firms like IBM who are an American domiciled country. Which means that that data from the Schengen information system has ended up in US hands breaking GDPR. And the Republican National Convention were also briefly very careless with voter data. This demographic data included the normal things like age and where you live and what demographic you are, but it also included things like magazine subscriptions. These are things that give you give political parties a really good insight into who their potential voters are. 
and in a very 1984-esque way, the Home Office in the UK destroyed the landing cards of the Windrush boat, thereby deleting any evidence that members of the UK population who'd come over from the West Indies had to prove that they had a right to stay in the UK. And that all of these bits of individual data are being used by commercial firms to help officers of a, a government to track illegal immigrants or to track anyone who's maybe just not part of society yet who is considered should considered they should be thrown out or discriminated against in some way and you definitely do not want to trust UK officials on the Wikipedia article at my last check there were about 30 instances of UK officials at all levels of government being plain careless with individuals data from a laptop being left in a taxi to someone handing in a thumb drive going did someone drop this officials are not trained to think about data in the way that we think about data it doesn't feel real enough to them so they don't care and we have another threat with cctvs all around us they've been around us for years we've grown up with them they're innocuous we don't notice them in restaurants we don't notice them really when they're out in the street anymore we're told that they're just to stop crime and it's for our own good for our own safety and that's all very well but we have a network of cameras that is growing every year particularly with devices like amazon ring which are being installed willy-nilly all over the place and ring has a very cozy partnership with law enforcement over 800 agencies in the us and they're getting very cozy with uk agencies as well and the way that they get sold in is the police can sell them on to customers who've been burgled, burgled and they go here you can have this at a discount and what's insidious is is that unless you explicitly opt out that data that you're doorbell collects will be shared with that police force or you can choose to just upload it to a neighborhood social network where everybody's paranoid and sending in reports for innocuous things like someone delivering a package you're putting into individuals hands the power to effectively be judge and jury and when people have the power to do that there are some very real consequences for those who are on the margins of society. But one fear that I have is we have this network of CCTV cameras and doorbells and the next logical place for this to go is you've got a picture of someone. What can you do with that picture? I know, we can make things frictionless for door entry. We can do facial recognition. How happy does she look, that lovely white woman? She's just so happy. Everything's just so much easier for her. But there's a slight problem with um, facial recognition and certainly with AI comparisons. There's bias built into these systems. In the US, the programming and the data sets are mainly of white people. So one is it means that the african-american and other minority communities aren't identified properly by this system but, go but google um, allegedly thought we can solve this let's go get some third-party contractors and according to the third-party contractors they were told to build up the data set of minorities by any means possible so they did it two ways they went to campuses with universities and got students to play a game where they got a starbucks card and they did the same thing with the homeless population as well, where they got a card and they were allegedly told to focus on that homeless population because they were less likely to ask questions. So there's a, there's a, there's a mismatch in thinking there. Technologists are thinking about the benefits of frictionless facial recognition without thinking about the consequences of this. And government, they want facial recognition as well for you to be able to access public services. In France, the LSM got launched in October and you have to use an Android phone to take a picture of yourself from several angles so that the government now has a biometric record of your face. And amazingly, they've rolled this out to French citizens 
not to people who are third country nationals. I honestly thought they'd do it to them first. And schools in China, and to some extent in America as well, are starting to implement classroom technologies for the students in the name of safety. Um, and it's got a bit of a twist because one of the systems that was trialled in China is being tested on two-year-old toddlers in Japan to check if they're engaged with the education system. The high school students that had the system trialled in, Ch in China, um, AI was combined with facial recognition to send a report home to parents if they're not paying attention properly. So students aren't paying attention, but they're doing the appearance of paying attention and they're knackered. They're not learning anything. And facial recognition will very soon be coming to Amazon Ring products because Amazon at the moment is developing recognition, which it's going to try and trial in its brick and mortar stores first so that you can have frictionless shopping. And it will be able to detect your emotions if you're happy or sad. Isn't she so happy? But yeah, let's continue the discussion about biometric and DNA and medical information. So DNA testing kits, as I've mentioned earlier, they're pretty innocuous in theory. Um, GEDmatch in the US has a very cosy relationship with law enforcement. They've recently been bought by another company that's even closer in with law enforcement. They've never had a problem handing over a massive data set of DNA information to help law enforcement because they've always believed that will help solve crime. And it did solve a crime, it solved the Golden Gate murders in Los Angeles because the perpetrator's relative had uploaded that data. Can other DNA testing services like 23andMe and Ancestry.com you still need a police warrant at the moment, but I wouldn't feel too complacent about that because 23andMe recently sold its DNA data set to a pharmaceutical company to develop more drugs. Now you can say, oh, but that's lovely. It's helping people. And it's like, you've got a precedent there. You've just gone and sold a data set to a commercial company. For now, it's for developing drugs. Where else could they sell that data now that the precedent has been set? And of course, with more and more of our healthcare system becoming private, there's a, a concern about your own medical records. We're gathering so much data, we're digitizing so many medical records. And in theory, if these are released to researchers, the medical data is de-anonymized. But last month, um, Professor T from Melbourne University got sacked because she made people aware of the fact that the data for 2.5 million Australians going back to 1984 can possibly be de-anonymised and the individuals can be identified by their medical conditions and other bits of data. And everybody gets really excited about being able to identify people by how they walk, how they express themselves, fingerprints, gates. But these are things that you cannot change about yourself. Or if you do change something about yourself suddenly, you're going to have a, some awkward conversations with the system when it doesn't recognise you. So, on its own, the collection of medical data, putting in your DNA data into these sites, is innocuous. But once the data is up there, it's up there, and that data can be combined with other data sets. And all of a sudden, you've got a medical profile and a DA profile of an individual. And imagine what health insurance companies can do with that. This is the modern panopticon. This semantic map. That little stylized brain there is you. All these little data points. All the people that you're connected to and their data points. You have a series of information and profiling and pressure points. How is that water feeling? So do we need privacy? Your family's on it? Yeah, they are on it. And there's still a risk. And we've been, been as bad. It's too late for us. We have to think about the next generation and the next generation after that. And teenagers don't care. That's not true. Teenagers do absolutely care. They've been used to working rounds, surveillance. They've performed a form of stenography 
in order to code messages to their friends that their parents won't recognise. And with tracking systems and facial recognition systems being rolled out across campuses in the US, the students are starting to protest about it and organisations like the Electronic, Fr Fronti Fr the Electronic F Freedom mm. Foundation are giving them tools to be able to do that. So yeah, they do care. And we need to give up a bit of privacy for our security? Well, I'm going to refer to a, a long dead American president for that one. Because Dwight D. Eisenhower was incredibly clear. He said that if all Americans want the security, is they can just go off to prison. You know, they'll have enough to eat, go to bed and roof over their heads. Maybe not in the US now. But if an American wants to preserve his dignity and his equality as a human being, he must not bow his neck to any dictatorial government. And he's right. What do we value more? Do we value being in that panoptic cell? Or do we, do we value being able to have a bit of space to ourselves, have a little bit of thinking time to ourselves? Do we really want to sacrifice our freedom and our personal dignity because we're a bit scared? Because I do not want the future to be that panoptican. I want free speech. I want free debate. I don't want censorship. So is there hope? That there is there's hope. The mainstream press are starting to, to wake up, mainly because journalists are starting to realise what the consequences are. And some cities in the US and in other places are considering a monitorium on facial recognition. And you're all here listening to this talk whether you are in the room or you're doing this remotely or you're watching it later. You care enough. So what can we do? Well, go to see my website, do your own research. It's all available online from the same spots that I found it in the first place. The mainstream press are waking up now. You'll expect to see more of this sort of coverage. But it's good if you go and do your own digging as well. This needs to be a, a proud effort in order for us to make a difference. And if you're a developer, build in that privacy from the beginning. Don't see legislation left the GDPR or something that gets in your way and your American competitors are just going to get it. There are people out there who care about the privacy who want to do something about it. And if you design in privacy from the beginning, you're making life a lot easier for you and your customers in the future. All of privacy focused organisations online, Privacy International, the Electronic Foundi Frontier Foundation, and certainly organisations like the ACLU provide lots of material for you to understand it. Downstairs, for example, there was the, the, the glass dome stand, which just explained quite a bit about what your routine can be like when you're doing things online. But like anything, you've, you've got a bit of a job to do yourself. You've got to do your own data detox. You've got to consider all those ways you've been interacting with the virtual world yourself. It might be you've had a Google account for years. And in order for you to be able to make the argument to your friends and family, you've kind of got to have an idea about how to de-Googleify yourself and what they're going to face as difficulties. And if you want the world to change, help support existing decentralised networks like Macedon, like Diaspora, look at the Activity Pub standard, look for applications that provide real world alternatives. And to some extent you can't just expect to point people at a video like mine to, for them to understand. It might work for a lot of people but everyone's an individual, you want to think about ways you can freeze personal stories, shared fandom moments in order to frame a privacy argument. You've got to try and give some empathy to your friends, your family, your chosen folk to, in order to get them to understand why this is a big deal. It's not enough to go and negotiate with them not to put your stuff online. You have to get them to care about what they can't put online. 
because you want them to focus on the cow. You want them to realise that they are Ayo, whether they realise it or not. Don't focus on the surveillance technology. It's cool and it's seductive and it's all about visuals and things. But it's a lot harder to focus on people than it is on tech. Because I don't want the future to be that panopticon. Think about simple stories and ways you can phrase individual conversations about privacy. You don't want to come at it from, you're wrong, Google's evil, they're just swallowing up your data. You've got to try and phrase the thought, acknowledge the use that they've been using these tools for years and help them find a way to do it, use another tool. For example, I posted two posts on Facebook around the theme of this talk. The first one didn't get a lot of reaction on Facebook because it's quite dull, it doesn't have a picture of me, and it doesn't really say much about what I'm doing, and it doesn't really bring empathy into the post. The second post, I acknowledged that tools like Facebook and Twitter are community tools. People interact in their communities using these tools. And people did watch the video and they interacted with it on Facebook. So there was a, a huge difference in take up with that. And everybody's culture is different. Everybody has different myths and legends and family history to help people interact with the subject matter. This is the reason why myths were developed in the first place. It was for social engineering. And of course, once you've got your family and friends on site, they're, they're all on board. You can start contacting your political representatives and start to push against the power of big data lobbies. Because political representatives often aren't that tech savvy either. And because you've been getting your friends and family to do this, they'll put even more pressure if you ask them the right way. And the more people that put pressure on our political representatives to consider the people that they represent, the more likely they are, they are to consider other sides in terms of the data debate, in terms of privacy. Because perhaps we can use that peacock as a symbol. Perhaps we can use it for the reason that Ovid thought. We can use those feathers to represent a monitorium on facial recognition on being able to stop companies like Clearview scraping your data. Because human rights violations are happening right now around us and it's only going to get worse as this pandemic continues. And we cannot normalise this data collection, this huge massive profile of each, each of us that is the virtual panopticon. And use that hashtag. The RFC was by the ITF, but the point of RFCs are to have a common framework of things like protocols. And we need to consider a framework for how we handle data and privacy. And this could be one way to do it. This needs to be decentralised, so use it. Thank you.